glasses. So I'm with you. I haven't done it before. Hey, uh, what what we'd like to do first is just for I'm going to say who I am, and then you'll say who you are, and, and you know your address and where you are and how old you are and your birthday and that kind of thing. But I'll start. Uh, I'm Mary Lynn Johnson. It's uh, Wednesday, September 28th, and we're here with Lieutenant Colonel Philip S. Gage. Mr. Gage, would you please introduce yourself? And I you can look at me if you want to. I am Philip Gage. Uh, what else do you want? Um, tell us. Uh, I'm 92 years old. When is your birthday, Mr. Gage? The 26th of June. 1912. Okay, what we'll do first is just get some background information about your military service and then we'll just sort of uh, ease into some questions and we'll see how it goes, okay? Um, when did you when did you first enlist in the Army? Enlist in the Army? Uh, other than ROTC that came first. Uh, I've joined the National Guard in Atlanta, Georgia with horse guards at the cavalry unit. That was the beginning. Okay. And did you, where did you attend college? Did, did, did not I was going to Georgia Tech Georgia at the Tech. time I was okay. in the Guard. Okay, and how did you make the trans, transition from I the Guard to the I, Army? I got a congressional approval. <laughs> No, I got an approval to take an examination to go to West Point through the Guard. Mm -hmm. And the Guard had, as most people know, had appointments every year or so. They didn't have one just automatically, you had to find out about it. And I guess you'd say I joined the Guard in order to get that appointment, okay. <laughs> which I did. But uh, I almost didn't get it because another man was not smarter than me. We were both pretty dumb, but I was just a wee bit ahead of him. <laughs> so I got the appointment to West Point. And this was in a non, the, the United States was not at war then. No. What made you decide to join the Army or the National Guard and then go to West Point? Well, I had to go to the National Guard to get to West Point. Okay. I so that was, West Point was your goal? That's right. Okay. Now, most of the Guard, if you remember, none of you were that old. Uh, the guard that I joined was a polo uh, playing outfit, and uh, they appealed to the people of Atlanta that liked to see polo games and so forth, so that's why they operated. But I didn't join for that reason. As I said, I wanted to join to try to go to West Point. And so I got there. And when did you, when did you move up to West Point? Um, The year following the, the, the allowing, I think I forgot exactly, but I was allowed to join, then I had to be in a year, and I think I joined the Guard and I had to serve a year before I went to West Point. But in the time that the year was up and the time that West Point opened, were kind of close together for me, so it was a kind of tit for tat deal in order to qualify, otherwise I had to go another year before the appointment was valid. It worked out all right. It was July the 1st, 1932. Okay. And when did you get your commission uh, after graduating? Uh, about June of 1936. And what was your what was your first uh, service like uh, after graduating from West Point? The first service was what I'd always wanted to do was go back to Honolulu, so that's where I went. And you were were you at uh, Pearl Harbor? Or oh no, this is quite a bit ahead okay. of that. I, this is 1936. Okay. And Pearl Harbor didn't happen three to three years later. Right. Yeah. Um, what, were, what was your first years of service like before the war? What kind of things did you do before the war? Well, uh, I served in Honolulu at Schofield Barracks and then down at Fort Chapter, which was the headquarters for the Army downtown. And uh, then I did something that uh, wasn't really military. I went back to West Point for the Pentathlon team in the mm -hmm. Olympics, mm -hmm. and I stayed there for uh, almost three or four months, and then they disbanded it because Roosevelt agreed to go to war. And so they said, well, we're not having any more Olympics, so you go. 
you can go back to an army base. And, and then I came down to Fort Benning. So where were you when the United States entered the war? Were you still at uh, West Point? Or? Out in the north part of Atlanta with my wife and my sister. I was on a, I was on a transition between going from here to, to California. Or vice versa, I forgot. But no, I, I, no, I'm sorry. I was coming back from California when Pearl Harbor hit, and then from there I went to Fort Benning for duty. What kind of thoughts went through your mind when you knew that, that you might be going to war soon? I can't remember that. I, I, I can't remember that. I think maybe it, but I hope we hurry up and go. Yeah, yeah I was an army brat, and I mm -hmm. did military all my life. So they didn't worry me too much. Not worry. I just mean, you know, you want to do what you could and do it as fast as you could and as good as you could and get going. So after after the war started, tell us a little bit about your tours of duty up until the time you you went to Normandy on D-Day. Well. I know I went down to Fort Benning, and I know that I, I was looking to go to school, and I went to the Italian officer school. And when I got through that, then I was up for another job, looking for another job, and I believe the next one I got, this is before the war now, the war had started. I went up to Honolulu, I mean, I went up to, to uh, Fort Orr, California, in Monterey, mm -hmm. and I was stationed there with a with a new division that was just started by, if I remember correctly, Vinegar Joe of Stilwell, mm -hmm. I was his after. And uh, while I was there, I met my wife. And uh, shortly after the war started, I, I requested the opportunity to come back and go to school, Fort Benning. I'm repeating myself now. Mm -hmm. I was talking earlier, now I'm coming back. Right. And so that was granted, and I was on my way to Fort Benning when Pearl Harbor hit right here in Atlanta. And then I went down to Fort Benning the next couple of days. And uh, I went to the school at Fort Benning. I couldn't confuse but which was which. Uh, but anyway, they, they, were, they were starting paratroop, paratroop. So, I was one of the first guys to go through, start to go through the school. And then I went out in the field one day and broke my foot. So they said, you can't do any more of this stuff. So they put me on some no good business, just fooling around, almost doing nothing. And uh, when my leg got finished, it got well, which was about three months later, I, I went in the paratroop. I was one of the earliest ones to start. So that's the way it went. What was life like at Fort Benning, getting ready to go to war? It, it was, uh, it's hard to explain because I think you're not aware of the important thing. You're not objective. I do remember one instance that I thought was very interesting to me anyway. That, uh, hundreds of people were coming in because of the war, reporting to Fort Benning. And the, the, the uh, Officers Club, which we all belong to, was so crowded. And uh, one of the things was that the men had, who had married a girl, like I had, uh, they were getting pregnant. And so uh, they wanted to keep with their husbands as long as possible. And they had the dances, and they wanted to go to the dances. And my wife had bought a pregnant evening dress several years before, which she would loan it all the damn post. <laughs> These women, they wanted to go to Fort Benning. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know, it, you, you didn't know, you know, you've seen it in the movies, I guess, the best way to describe it. And, uh, I don't know. And you see, the, 
went from the regular army, which I was, all had been in, all within your family, and you'd been in the war, and then the war came along, and then double and triple the number of people that were in the army came to join the army. So you really had a, a different characteristic. The people that were in there were maybe uh, hadn't had any idea of army life like we had. We, I've been in my life in the army ever since I was born. And you know, some of that rubbed off on me. <laughs> um, after you finished jump school at Fort Benning, where did you go? I reported to the uh, 82nd Airborne. And uh, I think there were about two, two divisions that it started at that time, and this was one of them. And I remember something that I can't believe it happened, but I was in the kitchen here one day, many, many years later, and some young man came in, I don't remember what it was, and he said, uh, you were the first company commander of B Company, 104th. Uh, and I said, yes, how did you know? And he said, because I was there. And I hope you remember it, I just can't believe it. It just doesn't make sense at all, but this was years and years and years later. And uh, I didn't stay with the 82nd because I had a chance to go to Fort Leavenworth, which was a staff school, and I went. And when I came back, they'd filled up the 82nd, so I went to the next uh, blossoming new outfit, and it was the 101st Airport. So it was the 101st that I stayed with and went over and went into Normandy. And after that, I went back to Walter Reed. And uh, I, I don't know, I'm talking too much. To no, you're not. Many <laughs> when I reported to, to Fort Benning, which was in the about November, not, not Fort Benning, Walter Reed, about October of 44, the year of the, of the invasion. Uh, a man, a soldier, met me at the gate, and he had both arms off, and he didn't have any combat ribbon on. And I said, uh, excuse me for asking, but how come you got your arms, whatever happened to them, all taken care of, and you're back and you're fit for duty as, as far as you can go, and uh, I'm just coming in, and I was the very beginning in Normandy and they haven't taken care of me at all. And he said, well, he said, uh, I was with a uh, demolition crew at Fort Benning and uh, it's very dangerous because you have to go up there and dismantle And I went up and it blew up both my hands. So he said, this happened to me uh, before June when you had your accident. So this, this man, uh, and, and in my memories, as I said, it's too terrible. All of you girls know who he is, and I forgot. But when they wrote a movie about the war, they picked on this man to be the leader of the best years of your life. Oh, I'm, and he I'm was he was yeah. in it. He was fantastic. I think he made two two movies and then got out. But this was that man. But the other day, I was I was trying to divide up some of the stuff I have downstairs to give to the kids. And my father had, a, had subscribed to a lot of Life magazines uh, towards the end of his career. And he put them in a bunch of books and they're downstairs in the basement. There's about flat-wise. The Life magazines are like this. And I got about five of them and he, he bound each one in this, that number of pe pe uh, uh, magazines to be about that, this thick. And this guy's uh, career is in that magazine. Uh, it's fantastic. And I just met him when I came down and he hadn't become famous and everybody knows who he is. You, you ought to know now. <laughs> well, I know who you're talking about. But I, I can't, I can't remember, remember his name. His name. But anyway. Well, so much for that. So, was your first action at on D-Day or did you see any, mil any no, battles before D-Day? No, D-Day was the first one. We, we got ready to go, and uh, of course, all the noises and all the actions and everything, and uh, it, it was it. I mean,
mean, I'm sure some other, some, some, some whatever they call them, boats got, went in and tried to de, uh, put my elbow No, you're away. fine. <laughs> uh, de, de what, de, un, 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 I don't know what it is, but we were the first operation to go in. Now, the, the Navy went in ahead of us to, to make way for it, but we were the first people in there. And uh, uh, the paratroopers, which I was a member of, uh, we went in about before midnight. And the people that came in over, over, over beaches came in about eight. We'd gone in there with about two, or two divisions of us, and then some English, and some Canadians, and uh, I took my grandson back there the first time we'd been back about three years ago. So that I saw all this area where I was, but I didn't recognize it. So I assume it's there because all the cemeteries and stuff are there. What town was it in France? Well, I've always wondered that. We took off about seven o'clock, and as far as I know, we flew around England in this great big sky train tremendously long number of airplanes. And I think they went in, uh, it was a full moon, I think we went in about midnight. Uh, I mean, by going in, I mean we left the, or being over the water where the, we couldn't get shot at. And then we got together in a long train, or pretty much so, and came down the, the line of France and and jumped off in, a, in a deep, decided places where we were supposed to land. Now, what I, what I learned this last trip, uh, I think I learned, was that uh, the regiment that I belonged to didn't do any action uh, of value for the, for the Allies because the, they, they landed in too many Germans where they were and they did, nobody knew anything where they were landing, they just landed uh, in the area that you were supposed to and do what you were supposed to do, but see, if the German, Germans were in, in large enough quantities that hadn't been blown up or gotten rid of, they got you. So I was one of the fortunate. <laughs> but then I, up north of us, there a lot of action that was successful for the Allies, with the, the English and the Americans. So that meant that the Germans weren't that strong up there, they, they'd been blown up and thrown up. But the people down there where we were, uh, there were enough of them around to, do, to pick me up. And, take me in. So, so you you flew in and you jumped. Yeah. Were you, and I know you were injured, uh, were you injured by no. gunfire or no. by the oh, fall? Oh, I was injured or? by gunfire when I, when I ran into the Germans, yes. So you were already on the ground, it wasn't yes. flak or anything? I'd already you know, I even cut a piece out of my parachute to give to my girlfriend and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, well, tell us, if you don't mind, uh, what, what your experience was like in the German POW hospital? Well, I don't know how to answer that, and I'll do the best I can to say that I hurt so damn much, it didn't make much difference. And I was, it was several weeks, probably later, when I was recovering that I, you know, I started being aware of things that could absorb them, and that's when I started writing my diary, which is the result of all I'm telling you. Um, one of the things that I wondered when I read your diary was about the nurses uh, there and the, and the care you received from them. Were they French or German? They were French and the, the hospital uh, group, they were all French. And all the allies were, 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 all, 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 of the, all of the patients were allies. Only the Germans were caretakers and they paid little attention to us. They didn't bother us at all. Well, that's a lot different than I had, I would have imagined, you know. I've, well, I think uh, the reason is because we were severely wounded, I think, and they knew there was nothing we could do, so they just left us alone. Now, if we'd been real POWs, they'd have been on all over, probably all the time, like you see in the movie. Mm -hmm. Well, as you were healing and getting better, um, did you have, what, what was going through your mind in terms of how am I going to get out of here, or when are the... When, are, when is the army going to get here and, and, 
and evacuate us and that kind of thing. I don't think I've ri arrived at that point yet. <laughs> I didn't know that yeah. was going to happen. I know that, and you probably saw it, there was a picture of four of us together, you probably saw mm -hmm. that picture. Um, all of the people but me uh, tried to get out and they were sent to other prison camps and farther and farther toward Germany and one of the, my good friends who's a Hawaiian, I mean from Honolulu, uh, as I understand it, if I remember correctly, he went all the way back to the, to the Pacific and went across that way and I, I don't know how long it took. And I think a lot of people did that because the Germans were pushing them back and then the Russians got in, interfered and I don't know what happened because I wasn't there. Well, after the evacuation uh, from, by the American troops, you went back to England. Yeah. Um, and tell us about what it was like to be back in England, and I'm sure you were communicating with your family at this time. You know, what was, you know, how did, how was it when you had to tell them of your injury, but you were okay? And well, I. I I think it was a matter of the war had to be fought and they didn't have to worry about me because I was not doing anything or anybody else like me until we were in a prison. We were in a hospital in England somewhere near where our outfit had been and there must have been other people like us back there. And so uh, I was in a hospital not too far from my outfit and I could go back to, to see the regiment say hello to my friends and then at night and stuff I'd come back to the hospital. And uh, 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 I don't think uh, I don't think that I wanted to try to go back to the unit and I know they would wouldn't have taken me either because I couldn't jump at that point. And that's all you're supposed to do. And how where were we supposed to go? You had to jump and I I just wasn't able to jump. That's the end. And I have never jumped again since, by the way, because I didn't try. I agree. It's a lost cause. Well, what kind of things did you do after you re regained your health and strength? What kind, well, what kind of jobs uh, did they put you at? One of my close friends that we met in England was a uh, jewelry maker, and he had been in World War One, and he'd been hurt in the hand, by the way, and it was kind of crinkled up, but it wasn't serious in, compared to having a hand off. And we were very close friends. He was also the, a good church member of the Episcopal Church, and I was too, so we, 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 we had very good friendship, and frankly, uh, we kept in touch, I think, until he died several years later, back here in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so he and I and his wife went on a vacation and in England, and I remember one of these three cases when I came back with him, we we were near a station and we looked off in the distance and we saw all these airplanes going across the sky the landscape, and that was the invasion of Holland. And I was, I knew damn well that I'd never join my eyes it again because they were gone. <laughs> and then it was a few days, or not more than a week or so, and I got on the transport and came home. Did you have any regrets about not being able to rejoin your unit? Well, I don't think so, because it's selfish. But I had such a burden with no hand that I didn't have to handle this thing. I was just, just looking one day to the next, what do I do to get back into whatever you do? So I didn't, but then we got on a transport to come back and it was nothing but wounded. And uh, you kind of got used to it and maybe that's just as well because you need misery loves company. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you do when you got back to the United States? Went to Walter Reed. And I was there about a year and a half. Let's see, in October. I was just there a little over a year. Walter Reed Army Hospital. Pardon me? The Walter Reed Army Hospital? Yes, yes. And were you there with, for physical therapy or oh, no, they had, were working? They, or? No, they did. When, uh, 
Am I boring you guys? No. No, I think it's interesting. Well, uh, I had a certain uh, obligation as a patient and everybody else did, but they could only go so far they couldn't tell nature to straighten up and give them a little discipline. They had to take nature, what, whatever nature gave them in the way of a healing, they had to wait for it. So I was free to, my wife came up when we had two little, two little boys, and I used to could go to the house and stay with them over the weekend or something like that, and then come back, check in at Walter Reed. So there's a lot of freedom in there, but it was nature trying to get going. Well, uh, uh, I don't know how to put this. It, it was nothing like being confined because I was in Washington and mother and daddy were stationed up in, Fort, in, in Boston. And I went back up to Boston for Christmas. My wife was there and my sister. And so I was free to do these things. But on this one Christmas, being uh, my mother had always fed her little boy, so she had a great big meal one day, and I lay down on the couch in the front room, and I felt gurgling in my stomach. And I said, Mother, will you come over here and put your head on my stomach and see if, tell me what you hear, if anything. So she did. She said, there's gurgling in there, and I don't know whether it's supposed to be there or not, but you know, I fed, fed you pretty well. Well, she didn't say that, but she did. <laughs> so, when I went back to Walter Reed, I said, you know, I'm not sure that the gurgling should have been there. And so they took the mixture and they said, it shouldn't have been there. And so they said, we got to give you another operation and find out what the problem is. So they found out that one of the bullets that had hit me had gone through my diaphragm and opened my chest to my stomach or something like that. So that if I ate too much like mother made me do, or <laughs> let me do, the, 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 the part of the stomach moved up into the chest and that's not supposed to happen. So they said, you've got to have an operation to put, for us to sew, the, sew, sew you up in the back, sew you up, on the, you know, where I'm talking about. So, um, uh, we prepared for this major surgery, supposedly, and uh, I guess I never hurt so much in my life as I did after that surgery. It was really sore. I found out, and it, this is all over the place, that there were so many people that were famous that uh, volunteered their services, and that this was supposed to be a, a great surgeon that was operating on my back, and his name You'd never guess, but his name was Dr. Blades. <laughs> and, and after this operation, it would seem to me about midnight or something, I was in a recovery room and there was another paratrooper friend of mine that I knew. And uh, we'd sit there and just be there for a while. And I'd say, you know, I can't take any more of this. I've got to get some, some what do you call it, to kill the pain? Murphy. 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 And he says, I'm with you. <laughs> so we were we were doing this as long as we could to keep to recover. And then when I got back in my room, I don't know if it was the same day or day or two later, I was amazed because there seemed to be a half a dozen uh, military men in there in a uni in uniforms other than than uh, the American. And when they left or at some point I asked the maid nurse, I said, what are all these guys in here looking at me for? And he said, well, that Dr. Blades is very famous and they went, they went in and watched the operation and they want to see what you look like at the operation. <laughs> so anyway, sorry. Well, that's, that's a great story. Um, so you, you went through the surgeries and you continued to heal and get stronger. Uh, what happened after you left Walter Reed? Well, before I say after, I'll say on the way out. Uh, let's see how that works. Uh, uh, it, it was something like this. I was, I was, I was either swerving or 
not being a good boy or something driving the car. And the policeman came up and stopped me. And he said, I'm going to give you a ticket. And I said, what for? And he said, because you violation of the code. He said, you, you're, you're supposed to be a veteran and you're supposed to be wearing a hook and you're not wearing your hook. So you're in violation of the <laughs> vehicle code. So I said, okay. So I learned that first lesson <laughs> on how it is to handle it going back into life again. <laughs> anyway, and that was on your way home from the hospital. What? That was on your way home from the hospital. Yeah, I was on my way to, to my new assignment out in Buffalo. I went up to Buffalo when I left the area. And what was your assignment in Buffalo? I was uh, I was working for the managing staff of a Chevrolet uh, automobile plant, and the the, uh, the president of the of the company had come down to interview me uh, before and offered me a job. So that's when I went. Up, I was going up there to take it. So you had been discharged from the army at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, going back to your days of service during the war, um, you mentioned the in your diary the the Sikh corporal and some other friends. Were you able to stay in touch with? Any of those people? Uh, I I was in touch with whom? I think you mentioned a uh, a, a Hindu, a Sikh. Oh, that man! Oh boy, he's in the picture, by the way. Mm -hmm. He is. And uh, he was a three hundred a guy. I like him, but he was poor, and all those people are. And by the way, uh, no, he was he was up in Afghanistan. I'm going on a trip next week to India, and he, India is south of where he went, he was up north of there. But uh, he'd been with the British soldiers, they, they had six, they liked them. They were uh, good soldiers, they were disciplined. But he got hit in Africa, and then he was in the hospital long before I got there. But we became real good friends, and I, I just, I guess I'm a vegetarian because of him, because I like yeah, that idea. But uh, where were you? Were you at the? I was just asking if you if you uh, were able to stay in contact with him oh, after yes. the war. Well, he we we wrote to each other up from from Buffalo, and uh, he he had gone home. I think he got out of the service. He had a family. He was trying to take care of him, but uh, financial situation in India must have been unbelievably lousy. So he was asking for things and uh, he was asking me if I could get him a typewriter. I don't know whether I sent him a typewriter or old one or something. But uh, uh, I think what I did or something, my daddy said, please don't give me my address because you might ask me for an automobile or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was um, did you receive any citations or medals uh, during your service? Uh, a few. Want to tell us about those? I'd like to tell you that when you the first in you get everything. We were. And uh, Everybody liked to wear them, and I think it's disgusting. And I remember Eisenhower, there's a picture around here showing me the other day, he had his medal down there with 33, three on each little line, and he had about 33 down there. And he put out an order or a suggestion or something when, he was, when Chief of Staff at the Pentagon. I mean, he said, I think that people are wearing too many medals, and it looks awful, and it doesn't. It messes up the suit, it's not the same color, and blah, 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 blah. And I don't think it, that lasted very long because people just like to show off. And they, they wear them all over the place. And 33 of these things, and they don't mean anything, and most people don't know what they mean anyway. And when you read these books like I do, I know some of them are really important and people can't get those. <laughs> 
So, I don't know why I answered your question or not. Well, I'm, I'm, I'd like to follow up on, on that comment. Um, was your feeling about being overdressed with medals, did, did that come from any way from, from your, your military family history or your father being a general? Uh, what, what led you no, to come I to those things? No, I just think it was, I just thought that saying I'm a hero doesn't make as much sense as proven and having somebody come up and say, hey, I heard about what you did and congratulating something like that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of the, uh, uh, we got the first presidential citation, our division, and that's a little blue ribbon with a little encased in a little triangular gold uh, border. And you wore it on the left hand side. I don't know what you said you wore. You wore it somewhere. <laughs> And uh, one day I was out in the regimental area, and I saw a young soldier, and he had everybody wore it because if they'd been, if they if they made the invasion, they got this thing. I think we were one of the first to get it. People have got it ever since then, forever and ever. But we were the first. Anyway, he had a little gold star in the middle of this blue ribbon, and I knew that that didn't go with that ribbon, and I said. Uh, uh, you know what that ribbon is, and I guess he knew. And I said, well, what, what's the gold star for? And he said, kind of apologetically, he said, well, I just thought it make it look a little better. <laughs> and I got from that that everybody liked to put this stuff on because it makes them look better. And I thought that was ridiculous because that meant that they're, they're kidding themselves. They're, they're trying to fool people. And uh, my apologies. Well, during the, the time you were away, um, what kind of letters and correspondence were you receiving from home uh, and learning about your kids growing up and what kind of life your family was living? I can't give you an answer to that because it seemed like the period was so short and uh, things are happening all the time and I know I wrote my wife and I know she wrote me but I can't answer that really. I beg your pardon, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, is there anything you'd like to share with us about your post-military life that led you to Atlanta? Well, I think what led me to Atlanta was that, uh, that thing in Buffalo, which was the first expression, the people that took over after my mentor that was the manager, uh, they didn't seem to to uh, to have the same opinion about me that he did, so things weren't as fun or as pleasant as I would have had it. After all, it was uh, it was the labor people that were running that there, and then the people on the management and this, the association of. of of working conditions I had never experienced before and it wasn't as, as comfortable as I thought I'd like and plus if you've ever been in Buffalo you'll never go back again <laughs> as far as the weather is concerned so that made us want to get out of there too and so we came back down to Atlanta right away or as soon as I got through this but I don't think that answered your question. Well, that. sure, it brought you to Atlanta, and what did you do here in Atlanta? Then I, uh, my sister and my father knew certain people, and one of them was Al, Al, I shouldn't remember that. Anyway, he, he, he owned the, uh, printing company out where my daughter coincidentally now takes care of uh, poor children and, and the building has been torn down. Albert Love and uh, Love Enter no Love I'm sorry I just forgot the name of the company, but I worked I worked for him as a as a printer, as a salesman for printing. 
and uh, that didn't work out too well. So then my father had gotten out of the service and he went in the insurance business, so they all taught me to go in the insurance business. So I stayed there till I retired with the insurance company. So it wasn't a very exciting life. Well, we've about sort of covered your your history, at least in terms of the military. Is there anything else you'd like to add, just as closing comments, maybe some of the things you told well, us before we started the tape? Yeah, well, one of the things that occupied uh, a good part of my life, in which I'm interested in, is my classmates from West Point, knowing that I was out early and I'd still be able, available late, they, they made me the secretary of their class, which involved writing uh, notes about the class every three months. So I've been doing that ever since then. Since 1946? Yeah. Wow. And, and during the process, uh, when my father got out, he got out after I did. Uh, he was still in the service when I got out early. Uh, he got to be the scribe for his class. and. Uh, he did the same thing I did in his own way, and I did it in my own way. But because I'm so darn old, I don't know. Uh, there, there, there are not as many scribes. They've been moving around. I, I haven't been moved for some reason, I guess. They like the crap that I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very interesting, and we sure appreciate you sharing your time with us, and we won't take any more of your time. But it's a matter of time. I get all the time in the world. Except I'm getting pretty old. That's going to run out very short. I'm predicting two more years. <laughs> <laughs> I brought some Coca-Cola here for you guys. Oh, well, thank you. Let me turn the tape off. Get a chair.